Good morning, Grace Life. What a wonderful day to be together again as God's people, raising our voices, raising our thoughts to him in praise. We have so many things to be thankful for. So many things. I, I'm so grateful for the skilled musicians who lead us in our churches and the universal churches. Confession of faith. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm grateful for the encouragement that we have received over the course of the last number of days even. Encouragements from all around the world, and it's served to strengthen us. And um, it, it's, it's a provision of the Lord, really, is what it is. What a week it has been. There's, there's one highlight that, that stands above all the rest for me personally this week. And that was uh, in listening to a media soundbite uh, taken from last Sunday's sermon, which clearly articulated that Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is exclusively the head of the church, to which I say a hearty amen. And if there is someone here from Grace Life that can turn that into my personal ringtone, please, please come and see me. I'd be very interested in that. This morning we'll be in Mark chapter 13, as seen in your bulletin. And I'd like to begin reading at verse 1. I'd like us to have this text in the forefront of our minds as we, as we go through this morning's sermon. And so I'll begin with verse 1, and I'll just simply read through to the end of verse 13. A fam familiar passage for many. And then I will uh, give some context before we take a look at verses 9 through 13 specifically. And beginning with verse 1. As he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the, birth, the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you to the courts, and you'll be flogged in the synagogues, and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he 
will be saved. As far as the reading of God's word. <clears throat> well, certainly, as Canadians with a genuine saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have enjoyed many freedoms afforded to us by Canada's constitution. We have a freedom of religion. We've enjoyed the freedom of expression, the freedom of peaceful assembly, the freedom of association, and all of these things we've just simply taken for granted. And for 10 months now, we've been provided also with abundant proof Sufficient evidence that these fundamentals are no longer ensured. And there have been varied responses among the local churches across Canada. And it has shown that submission to government and human institutions is among the most divisive issue in our generation, if not the single most divisive issue facing the local churches today. And depending on how one approaches and interprets and applies Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2, together with instructions like how we are to love our neighbor, one either justifies complying with the ever-changing health orders or not. But the question remains. What does God see as a faithful response? What is his expectation for his people? Well, we have seen no shortage of voluntary, crafted media releases from many church leaders on behalf of their churches and I have to say that I've been disheartened by what seems to be a lack of discernment. One example took place in November when 23 pastors endorsed government restrictions saying this in a letter uh, released to the media. They said, we believe that Manitoba's current public health orders in no way contravene our ability to obey and worship God. They are not anti-faith. They are pro-life. Now, I'm shocked at that. I mean, I think I understand what the meaning of pro-life is. I would define it uh, perhaps differently than maybe what they're trying to do here. Certainly our government um, has no concern for human life. The number of abortions and doctor-assisted suicides in this province alone in one year surpass an entire year of COVID deaths. So we can't say that government is pro-life. The statement goes on to say, the Manitoba government has allowed faith communities to continue to meet and minister where possible. For this, we're grateful. Well, again, I, I cannot concur I don't believe it's government that gives an allowance to churches. I think that authority is God's alone, and he has determined that we ought to gather together for the purpose of worshiping him as he has prescribed to us in his word. And the doors of Manitoba churches, which closed officially on November 10th, remain so indefinitely. In another three-minute YouTube video released by a senior pastor out of Winnipeg, he appealed to the government to allow for the practice of faith, specifically through drive-in services. In that three-minute video, he made no reference to God, no mention of Christ, no appeal to the truth of Scripture, in fact, any world religion, any cult, or any movement could have endorsed his words. And sadly, this empty appeal 
drew the scathing rebuke of 75 more pastors. United, Anglican, Catholic, and select Mennonite conference churches. I would deem this to be the religious left. In their carefully crafted media statement, they said, we find that your insistence on the right to worship is not in keeping with Christ's command to love our neighbor. And they went on to insist that you repent of your actions and publicly apologize for putting your individual right to worship ahead of the good of our community. I believe that these pastors and these churches are representative of a multitude of other local churches across our nation. And I'm burdened by this. I have to wonder, what does the consumer of the mainstream media, how does he or she perceive the nature and purpose of Christ's church given these types of statements, given these types of positions? Well, we know that God will be glorified. But how would he have us most glorify him then? Maybe our question. And this morning I would actually ask that we shift our focus away from all of that that we've just heard. Away from the debate about rights and freedoms. Because I believe there's a greater problem at play here. And the text here this morning, I believe, exposes exactly this greater issue. It's a problem with understanding our priority. Understanding the priority of the church. And understanding what our chief priority would be. I'm not saying that those other things aren't aren't important. I'm not saying that we don't discuss them all together. That we put them completely to the side. But what I am saying is that we would make sure that the emphasis remains where it needs to remain, where the words from our lips are the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ first and foremost, as we're presented opportunities. That's what our chief priority ought to be. Now, Jesus, and this is Wednesday of Passion Week, 48 hours roughly before his crucifixion, he instructs his disciples specifically about this priority. And so, beloved, come with me. Let's walk away from the raging rights and freedoms debate. And let's this morning consider the Christian priority amid persecution. The Christian priority amid persecution. And let's just get a a quick sense of this context that we're in here. As I've already said, this is the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. He'll die in two days on the cross. And Jesus had been sitting in the temple, and he's been essentially reading the hearts of men and women that he has seen in the temple. He's watched the widow give all that she have, all that she has. And he's, he's watched others give just simply out of their abundance. And he's also indicted the religious leaders. Their indictment is that they pursue prestige and honor. They're consumed with greed. They've even robbed the widows. They're constantly showing off a false piety. And they lead, mislead people ultimately to their demise. They're condemned. And while God is not fooled by appearance, Jesus' Jesus's disciples certainly are. Because we can see in the text, in the first couple of verses, For them, there's this anticipation that's mounting. Thinking that soon the Messiah is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. However, 
I think we have to admit that their understanding, their focus is on a wrong trajectory. And that's what really brings necessity to this, the longest of Jesus' discourses. And so there, sitting on the Mount of Olives with the temple clearly in view, Jesus provides for his disciples a prophetic unveiling of the future. And in it, he warns his followers of impending dangers. He exhorts them to remain watchful. And he calls for obedience and for perseverance while encouraging them to remain faithful. And his discourse serves to answer the disciples' questions that we've already seen out of verse 4. Tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? His reply describes many events that will be witnessed later in the New Testament record. And many of these same occurrences continue on and through the church age. We can see that. While the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed in AD 70, according to verse 2, false teachers continue to proliferate. And there will be wars and rumors of wars, famines and natural disasters, as we've already read this morning. And in this, there will also be an ongoing pattern of persecution brought about by a concerted hatred toward Christ. And that is our focus this morning. It's this persecution that we find ourselves in. Jesus Jesus' words remind Christians of what their priority must be through the generations. We must first be heralds of the gospel of Jesus Christ even amid waves of persecution. Now, let me just take a moment to define persecution for us this morning. We could say that it's a program or a process designed to harass and oppress someone specifically for their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? That's our definition of persecution. And when Christ's church is told that she is not permitted to worship as God has prescribed to her in his word, and then when measures are put in place to ensure that that prohibition is followed, that's persecution. And that's what we find ourselves in. Albeit mild as it is, it's still persecution. And I think we can be thankful even this morning That this is taking place in this generation. And for our children to see. For our children to see the stand that we take. Because the gospel of Christ is at stake. Now as an aside. Just briefly. Back in August I preached out of 1 Thessalonians. In chapter 2 verses 13 through 16. And interestingly enough I preached on persecution. And here I find myself this morning again. Now at that time, we saw that there was a contrast between the persecuted and their persecutors. That was really the premise of the sermon. And there were these distinctions that we could see from the text. We we learned that the persecuted accept the word of God. Well, their persecutors reject the word of God. We saw that the persecuted, they imitate righteousness, while the persecutors intimidate the righteous. And then we saw these promises that the persecuted will endure through suffering, while the persecuted, their end will be suffering. If Gasping for your final breaths under the the power of COVID is excruciating. It could be only a foretaste for those who are destined to hell 
And we need to remember that hell is real. This morning, we'll see five insights into persecution, in the context of persecution. And this is for the purpose that we would understand that the gospel should be our priority because hell is real. So we'll see our Lord provide five insights to his followers within persecution so that you will know what your primary response should be in these times. And I've broken down the outline this way. So in verse 9, we'll see the purpose of persecution. And then in verse 10, we'll see the priority in persecution. In verse 11, the preparation for persecution. And then in verse 12, the price of persecution. And then finally, in verse 13, the promise amid persecution. So first, let's understand that there is purpose in persecution. So draw your attention back to verse 9. Let's take another look. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And Matthew records this, but much more briefly in chapter 24 and verse 9 when he says, then they will deliver you to tribulation. And this is some of that tribulation. Christ's followers will encounter trouble that inflicts distress. And these times will be marked by oppression and affliction and suffering. Now, Luke's gospel, on the other hand, also shares Jesus' warning regarding this very same persecution. And Luke writes, But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you, And will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my sake. And that's in chapter 21 and verse 12. So there's a a certainty that Jesus is giving us in these birth pangs, these signs. And it's only the beginning. And it includes persecution. And again, as I've already said, this has been evidenced through, throughout church history by Christ's followers. It's not surprising as, as Jesus warns his followers then to be watchful. And here in verse 9, he begins with this emphatic warning. Be on your guard. Literally, the text reads, look to yourselves. And this is in the imperative. This is... Like saying, pay close attention. Be aware of the things that are happening around you. Read the times. Understand the times that you're in. Be watchful. Why does Jesus warn? Is it that his disciples ought to then flee from this persecution? The text gives no indication of that. Although we know that Jesus has in the past, he's instructed his disciples to to flee, right? Flee from those cities that persecute you, Matthew 10 and 23. But not this time, not here, not under these circumstances anyway. Rather, he warns to be on your guard so that in the face of persecution, you will remember to respond in a particular fashion. Now, what what does this persecution consist of? What's this going to look like? Well, Jesus describes this persecution. And he uses forms of the Greek verb paradidomi three times in this short pericope, in this this paragraph here. In verse 9, he says that they will deliver, right? So there's this delivery, delivering over. And then in verse 11, the same for, uh, derivative is uh, translated as, you'll be handing over, 
And then again in verse 12, there's going to be this betrayal. Okay, you will, they, brother will betray brother. And so here, when Jesus says that they will deliver you, he's saying you're going to be handed over. And there's a nuance here that you're going to be placed into custody. You're going to be viewed as a criminal. And this being delivered over is for the, the purpose of you being judged, condemned, punished, scourged even, tormented, perhaps put to death. And ultimately, this delivery, this delivering over, is just simply defined by treachery. You'll be treated treacherously. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. Peter actually uses this term in his indictment of the Jews in Jerusalem. And we know how Jesus was treated despite his innocence, right? This doesn't surprise us. We, we've seen it in the gospel account. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. Peter's words from Acts 3 and verse 13. And so now Jesus is telling his followers that they can also expect to be on the receiving end of similar treatment. He's, he's speaking in a passive sense here. They will be the recipients of these actions. And you see that the persecutors dole out this unjust treatment as it's afflicted upon Christ's followers. And really... They cause the believers to share in Christ's afflictions through this, to a degree. We, we see Peter write about this in 1 Peter 4 and verses 12 through 14, where he writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so we can expect this to occur. We can expect to share in similar sufferings, even as we've seen in the sufferings of Christ. Jesus goes on to say, you're going to be flogged. You'll be beaten by the so-called religious authorities. This, this flogging, this term, is originally meant to really remove skin layer by layer through a thrashing. And this, this punishment is intended to publicly disgrace. Now, I guess we, we could maybe see it in some milder way, much milder way. We haven't been flogged this week, but certainly we've been flogged in the court of opinion, in the court of public opinion. In any case, we can expect greater hardships than that. Paul himself flogged Christians in the synagogue prior to his uh, conversion. We read that in Acts twenty-two nineteen. Then he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 11, he says that five times he was also the recipient of a flogging as Christ's apostle. 39 times he was lashed. I can't help but think that Paul's body must have been quite marred by the end of his time on earth, by the end of his, his ministry. But this is what we can expect. This is the treatment that we can expect. I don't know how harsh it's going to be, but we can expect it. And then secondly, another passive verb here. We can expect to be made to stand before authorities. And this time, we're going to be placed before secular authorities, before government officials, both regional or federal. 
even as is shown in the book of Acts, where Jesus was brought before Pilate and Paul before Felix and Festus, and even other authorities at higher levels, like the Herods, or Paul before Nero. But why? Why the suffering? Why this persecution? Why would Christians be made to go through this? Why not just simply a life of ease? Well, there is a purpose for this. And we see Jesus express it very simply. He says, this is for my sake as a testimony to them. And Luke states it, states his purpose very matter-of-factly in 21, or sorry, yeah, 21 and verse 13, where he says, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. And so that's what it is. It's the Lord giving us an opportunity to testify to the truth of Christ. Now, we've had already several opportunities as a church to testify to the same truth. The Lord has brought the RCMP into our building here. The Lord has brought the health authority into our presence And so we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we're serving as a testimony to them. But how do we do this? How do we serve as a testimony to them? Do we do this by showing them that we think exactly as the culture thinks? No. Do we, do we show, serve as a testimony to them by interpreting the times exactly as the world has interpreted these times? Not at all. This persecution is not about our perceived rights and freedoms. It's not about any one local church. It's not about any one local pastor. It's not about a conglomeration of churches or pastors. And we need to even in this time, we need to guard against being puffed up. We need to remain humble. Our testimony inside of this persecution is first and foremost regarding Christ. And that's the testimony of someone saved by the gospel. And that's the testimony, the same testimony by a Bible-believing and gospel-centered church. Let's be clear on that. So how will God use our testimony, yours and mine, in this persecution? I believe he does that in two ways. I believe that some will receive the gospel. We know that God is mighty to save. And so through the testimony of God's grace in our lives, others too will be justified. They will be saved. But then another way that he'll use our testimony is for those who reject our testimony. It's going to serve as a testimony against them. And it's going to serve as a testimony against them on the day of judgment because they've rejected Christ, because they've rejected the gospel. <clears throat> And so the purpose of persecution is to provide us with opportunities to testify to Christ and that some would be convinced through it. We're entering into unprecedented times amid persecution and suffering. I think it's only going to increase. I'm not exactly sure how. It's like we're coming to church Sunday after Sunday trying to anticipate what's this going to be like, right? And we can't. We don't know. But the Lord knows, and we need to remain faithful in walking in obedience. And remember that while innocent, even while we're innocent, we will still submit ourselves to the consequences of obeying God. That's our submission. 
will submit to the, gov to the government's consequences that, that um, come from our obedience to God. Now, we understand that this must take place. And each of these, again, is a, an opportunity for us. And this isn't an opportunity that we've brought upon ourselves, but we need to understand that this is by divine appointment. Any official that we come before, is, is, it's an occasion brought about by our sovereign God. And so it has great purpose. And let's take those opportunities to proclaim Christ. So that's the purpose in persecution. Now, second, let's recognize our priority in persecution. Our priority in persecution. Verse 10. The gospel must first be preached to all nations. And Matthew says this. He says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. He says that in chapter 24 and verse 14. So in the midst of these, of these vivid descriptions of persecution, there's this one great task that is given to us. It's this one great and shining light in the midst of the distress of darkness that surrounds. And it's given just as a simple statement of fact. The gospel must first be preached. Now, we can look to Paul's calling and to his life as it serves as, a, as an excellent illustration for exactly what we're talking about here, for exactly what the Lord is instructing his disciples on. Speaking of Paul, Christ said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake, out of Acts chapter 9. Paul himself articulates the priority of the gospel in his ministry to the Corinthian church. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And interestingly here, we see Paul use that very same verb, paradidomy. There's this delivering that's happening, right? He, his, his task is to deliver over. But he's not delivering over persecution as he himself has experienced. While Paul was delivered over to be persecuted by religious and secular authorities in his lifetime, at the same time, he delivered the gospel to them. You see the exchange? And that was what he said was of first importance to him. So let's not lose sight of even a few things here. We know that the word goes out and it will not return to God void. Isaiah 55 expresses that. And that it saves or it hardens. And secondly, the gospel has to be preached for people to be saved. I'm going to say that one again. The gospel has to be preached in order for people to be saved. They do not look at my lifestyle and are drawn to, to Christ, are saved as a result of that. They need to have the gospel of Jesus Christ land on their ears. And that seed needs to land on the fertile soil of their heart, which God prepares because he has crushed the hardened soil into something that can receive it so that it can take root. And it's only through the gospel being proclaimed that people are saved. There's no pragmatic approach that's ever going to save anyone. And this is a concern for me, again, a burden as I read about these churches in the media. And I wonder, are these gospel-centered churches churches? 
The Bible clearly says it's the gospel that saves, the message of Christ. In Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And then again in James 1 and verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. And we see again in 1 Peter 1 and 23. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. It's the gospel that saves. And it is Christ who effectually calls by this gospel. They will hear my voice, he says in John 10 and verse 16. They hear the word of Christ. And they are brought out of their sin and delivered and redeemed. And then we must also understand that this is by divine decree. This is, this is why this is happening, because God has decreed this to happen. And we see this in Ephesians 1 and verse 11. This, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. The gospel goes out, and God uses it to save sinful man. And so here, it's no wonder that Jesus is speaking emphatically. There's a necessity here. He says this with great emphasis. The message of salvation through him must go forth amid and through the opportunity that's presented through persecution is essentially you know, what he is saying here. Our persecution in Edmonton and surrounding areas remains mild, as I've already said. And I would say that now is the opportune time to be preparing and continue to prepare for gospel proclamation. There's no better time than now. And he has brought a diversity of people from all nations, all around us, even here locally. So let's take that opportunity. And so we've seen the purpose, that our purpose is to testify to the truth. And that there's a priority given to evangelism in persecution. Now third, we need to be preparing for persecution. How? How? Well, let's take a look at verse 11 here. This will become abundantly clear. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Now, we have to admit that there is just this natural tendency of, in us to be always thinking, always having these conversations, always being prepared to give some sort of defense for what we think lies ahead. It's, it's inescapable, right? We battle this every day. If I get arrested, then I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to say, right? Or this is exactly how I'm going to get out of this situation. That, that's just our natural tendency. And we do this on even such small scales, you know, when we think that somebody else is going to try to coerce us in some way into doing something, and we want to gain the upper hand, we plan. That's what we do. But there is a, um, there's a prohibition that is taking place here. We're not to worry beforehand. And so perhaps maybe the best way to illustrate this is directly out of the book of Acts again. Really, the book of Acts, is, it serves as a commentary for this, these exact five verses that we're going through. We see this persecution and the response in persecution is clearly laid out for us in the book of Acts. So Peter and John are jailed by the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees in Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> Why are they jailed? Well, the text tells us that 
they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they're proclaiming the gospel. And this arrest alone led to the salvation of roughly 5,000 people who came to believe in Christ. So the Lord used this for his purpose. And then the next day, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to probably some of these same rulers and elders, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone and that there's no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Verses 10 through 12 of chapter 4. Notice here how the apostles, and really God uses this man's miraculous healing as an opportunity to bring forth the gospel of Christ. And then later, we read the apostles say, when they're again brought under the thumb of the authorities, they say this, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to give, sorry, let me start that again. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. This shouldn't have happened this way, at least not in the minds of the authorities, not in the minds of those who were in the audience, because they perceived these men to be uneducated. They perceived them to be untrained. And yet we know that it was the Spirit that carried them forth, not that they were just brought about mechanically to say the things that they said. No, they had... They had knowledge of the scriptures, remember? Christ had opened their minds to what the scriptures said, and that remained in them, certainly. So they knew what they were talking about. And we know that Jesus had told them that the Holy Spirit would come and bring to their remembrance the things which he had said. So these disciples, they were well prepared. They were equipped by the Holy Spirit. That begs the question, how can we be prepared? We too, we need to be preparing even at this time. Notice that Jesus, he's giving a prohibition to worrying, but that doesn't prohibit us from preparing. We need to be doing that. And that requires us to be in the word of God regularly. And the Lord will use that in the moment. He'll bring that word about by his spirit, but we need to know it. Consider what the psalmist David and his preparation for persecution, as we read about it in Psalm 119, where he writes, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. In order to speak the testimonies, one must know the testimonies. And then again, he says, in verse 140 or 157, he says, Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I do not turn aside from your testimonies. He doesn't depend on being clever. This isn't clever arguments that he's raising. No, he trusts wholeheartedly in the sufficiency of the testimonies of God. He raises them to the highest importance in the face of persecution. And then again in verse 161, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. We know where our strength comes from. And we rest in that. 
but we must be preparing. And again, I'm reminded of all of the encouragement that we've received over this last week and how those encouragements have been infused with the word of God. And it's really those verses that are shared that cause us to be uplifted. So don't stop. Let's, let us not stop preparing because even in giving those encouragements, you are being further prepared. Luke's gospel recounts Jesus' exhortation and his encouragement this way. And he writes, So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. And so we need to have a reliance. We need to trust in the wisdom that only God provides. And let us not rest in our own acumen. Worrying beforehand only removes our reliance from God. And that we certainly do not want. So we've seen certainly in this world of distractions that we live in, we need to continue to prepare. And we do so by saturating ourselves with the word of God. Because he will use that word in the moment when he gives us those opportunities. And so we've seen the purpose in presenting, testifying to the truth. We've seen a priority in gospel proclamation. And now this preparation that needs to take place, not relying on ourselves, but relying on the word of God that's been written on our hearts. And fourth, there's a price to persecution. In verse 12, we read, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. These are, these are shocking words. These are extreme examples, really, really the familial relationships that we wouldn't even necessarily imagine that we, we could be handed over by a brother or a sister. But we need to understand that the stakes are high. And Jesus conveys the gravity of living as one of his followers. Here again, we see paradidomy used. This is a betrayal. This is a delivering over, a handing over. A handing over as, as one who is guilty, who is going to be treated as guilty despite being innocent. And so the price is high. And the simple fact is that we need to count that cost. And at the same time, we need to remember that God is sovereign even in the suffering of his children. Even in the face of the greatest of betrayals, God is sovereign. And we see here in this betrayal, again, we share to a degree in the sufferings of Christ, even as he was betrayed, as he was handed over. So let's have, again, a proper perspective of God's sovereignty in this. And J.C. Ryle provides, I think, a really good perspective for us here when he writes, nothing can hurt God's people except and until God permits. We are all immortal until our work is done. To realize that nothing happens in the world except by the eternal counsels of the Father and according to his eternal plans is one grand secret of a living of living a calm, peaceful, contented life. Even if we are betrayed by family, the Lord is sovereign and has brought that about. Jesus, this is not, nothing new to what Jesus told his disciples. And we know this, right? Jesus said that brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You'll be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. That's uh, basically, 
a word-for-word -word repeat of Matthew 10 and verses 21 and 22, and we see it here again. Jesus also said at that same time, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then he also says in Luke's gospel, Luke records, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That is how great the cost is. The price is the highest price. The price means putting Christ ahead of absolutely everything. All else takes second place. All else is counted as loss. But we know the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Jesus, our Lord, as Paul writes in Philippians. This doesn't mean, though, that we search for ways to get people, even family members, to hate us. No, we need to, we need to walk carefully. But understand that this will happen. It's inevitable as our biblical worldview comes into conflict with secular worldviews. And a secular worldview is one that does not acknowledge God. God has been removed from the equation. And that's really what brings us into conflict. That's really what causes us to come under the threat of being betrayed even by our brother. The price of persecution is high. But the reward is higher. And so finally, let's take a look at Christ's promise here. His promise amid persecution. Because while the price is high, the reward is great. There's a great promise here that Jesus finishes off this, this section with. He says, you'll be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. So the scope of hatred is enormous in the world. We've already seen that. And it's because of its refusal to subject itself to Christ. And as a result, there's a trickle-down hatred that occurs, not based on our appearance or not based on our behaviors, not because of personal faults that people would perceive in us. It's not because of a social rank or standing. It's not because of a position that we have. It's not because of our ethnicity or a nationality or your gender or age. It's not even because you've received 8,000 hits on your recent sermon. It's not because of any of those things. But this hatred is because there's a hatred of the message of the cross. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. And this hatred is hatred because they see in us an unwavering love for Christ. And so our suffering ensues. And Paul endured this persecution and suffered as a result, suffered greatly. Even after being stoned in Lystra, he ministered resolutely, saying that he was strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And then as he's writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, about these exact same experiences in Lystra, Paul writes, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3, 12. 
And so while we know there's going to be persecution, yet we need to endure. We need to have in mind, we need to set our minds on enduring. Understanding that there will be a final victory, as even is promised here, when the believers are saved. When they are glorified, essentially. This is the crown of life spoken of in Revelation 2 and verse 10. Our ultimate salvation, if you want to call it that. But how does one endure to the end? How can we endure? How can we press on with endurance? Well, the Bible gives us several, um, several exhortations, really, in our endurance, to spur us to endurance. In Hebrews 12 and verse 1, the Bible says that we must constantly be setting aside sin to endure. And then in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 4, we need to be continually presenting ourselves as suitable servants of God. And this will certainly include gospel proclamation and gospel preparation. And then in James 1, we endure by having our faith tested and being willing to face hardship. And again in verse or chapter 5 and verse 11 of James's epistle, we see that there's endurance that comes about by knowing that God is compassionate and merciful. It's really resting in the promises of God. So persecution and its insured suffering really seems to be the preferred means used by God for many different purposes. First and foremost, the gospel goes out. He also uses it to build us further as well. Now, listen to Bavink and his observation on Gen out of Genesis chapter 3 and verses 9 to 13. That, that's the portion of text where God hands out these curses, but yet in the middle of the curses received at the fall of man, there's this plan of, his redemptive plan sits amidst the curses. And Bavink, as he looks at this text, he makes this observation. He says, from this point on, the road for the human race will pass through suffering to glory, through struggle to victory, through the cross to a crown, through the state of humiliation to that of exaltation. And this is the fundamental law that God here proclaims before entrance into the kingdom of heaven. That's such a profound insight. This is God's preferred means that he would first have us go through suffering in order to be glorified. That that suffering would bring about a sanctification process in us. And this is a consistent theme that we see throughout scripture. So the promise for the Christ follower is that the one who endures to the end amidst the persecution, amidst the suffering, this is the one whom God will glorify. And so this discourse is not about being able to identify a point in time on, on God's historical timeline. Where are we at exactly at this moment? I, I don't believe so. I don't think that's the main concern here. Rather, I would say that this is about telling his disciples and us as well that we need to remain resolute and ready, constantly preparing for the purpose of testifying to the truth, having an evangelistic priority, and being prepared by knowing the, the word of God, preparing by knowing the word of Christ, and doing so with an unwavering loyalty to Christ, ultimately, that we would hear him say, well done, good and faithful slave. Now, 
I made mention of a few churches earlier. Our, our prayer should be that they and many others, and I can't uh, presume to, to know if, which are gospel churches and which are not, but our prayer should be that they would examine themselves and ins to ensure that their priority is making sure that the gospel is being proclaimed and that that would be their first priority and not to get sidetracked. We know that sinners need to be called to repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ. And we know that we've been given a great commission to fill. And we must work towards that. Now, maybe today there's someone sitting here who has another purpose. Your purpose is not in testifying to the truth. But your purpose is in advancing something else. And your priority is not fixated on the gospel and on Christ, but rather your priority is fixed on, fixated on yourself. You're preparing for other things. The price is far too high for you. And there's a promise of death because you remain in sin. In the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. That from the one who owns, possesses all things, created all things, and because he, he did so, he is the only one who can make that statement and carry it through. And man fell by breaking that one simple commandment. And everybody since has been born into sin, born with a sin nature, born into rebellion against God, and completely incapable, completely incapable on your own of doing anything, doing any works that would be received as acceptable to God. And God knew. God sent his son to live the perfect life, to become the perfect sacrifice so that you could have your sins removed through his sacrifice, not through anything that you could possibly do. Even your best works are filthy rags to God. But God was pleased to send his son as a sacrifice for sin that sinners could be rescued out of the bondage that they're in, out of the slavery to sin. And we know that the wages of sin is death. But we also know that the free gift of God, it's a free gift. And that free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so I would say, what prevents you from grasping hold of this even this morning? What would stop you? Is your, that temporary gratification that you receive from your sin, is it, is it that compelling that you would remain in it, knowing that it's only for a short time of enjoyment? knowing that it ultimately will lead to your destruction? No. Today must be the day of salvation. Today. Tomorrow may be too late. We have no idea if any of us will even get home this morning. You have no idea when your heart will stop beating. And so why would you put it off? Why in the world would anyone turn away from that and continue on in their rebellion against God? Repent. That's what the Bible says. 
you must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing him as Lord and believing in your hearts that he raised them from the dead. And the Bible says that you too will be saved. Don't put that off. That is the priority. And that is our priority, that we would tell people about that, that we would tell them about not only the cross of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ, how the Lord was, how the Father was, was pleased through what Jesus had done and how he was raised from death to life again to defeat sin, to defeat death, and ensure that we would have eternal life. Why would anyone wait? Father, we thank you so much that you have compelled us in our hearts to come to Christ. And we thank you for the salvation that is found only in him. Father, I pray that that would be our priority. That this message of salvation through him, Lord, that that would be on our lips. That that would be our ready defense for the hope that is in us. That you would further equip us to proclaim that message to those who are dying in this world. Father, we are so grateful for your glorious mercy towards us, your glorious grace. Father, we pray now that you would prepare us further to come before you and partake of your table. Amen.